Hello. Uh, well, it's great to be here, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really excited. And today I'm going to be talking about the art of testing. We all think of testing as a science, right? We have, um, we set up some conditions, we uh, try and make them deterministic, we have assertions as outcomes at the end. It's almost the definition of science. It's almost the scientific method. And yet, I think, in practice, it's much more like an art. And so this is what I'm going to talk a bit about. So this is me. Um, I do have a book, which you don't have to buy. But, uh, and I, I've, I've done some open source projects around the theme of testing, because I believe testing is so important. Um, and it gets a bad rep sometimes. So I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about why that is. Oh, so yeah, I did uh, testify. Uh, which is um, like gives you like assertions and helpers and stuff, and is is like a lightweight version of that, and then some others which I'll get to. So first of all, whenever I talk about here are some practices that I think are worth thinking about and worth uh, sticking to, there is always some great reasons why you would want to break these rules, and this this is no exception in this talk. So the important thing is that you think about and have a good reason for uh, doing what you're doing, and it's really that's the important thing. So why do we write tests, then? I was thinking about this. There's actually quite a few benefits. But the main one is around maintainability. We're obsessed with how long something's going to take to build the first time. You know, all our estimation sessions are around this. We have, um, we have tools, lots of tools are built that help us to try and figure out how long it's going to take us to deliver that first feature, of that, that thing. But really, for successful projects, the lifetime, over the lifetime of that code, the cost of maintaining it is far higher uh, and, and a lot more complicated and a lot more difficult a process. So really, we should be obsessed with maintainability of code, not really how long is it going to take just to get this first thing done. So I think the main benefit for testing is to improve maintainability of our code. We don't want this situation. We've all seen it on a project where we have um, dark caverns in code that we, don't, we dare not venture down, um, and, the, and we're kind of scared of what's lurking there, and we don't want to break it. And there's the wizard on the team, the old wizard, who uh, understands you know, they're the only one that can do it. Well. I hate to break it to you, but that wizard is soon going to be recruited by Microsoft. And uh, <laughs> so we have to not have those little areas. We have to be brave and, and, and shine a light on it all. So maintainability, for sure. Um, I think we also want to be able to sleep at night. We want to know that the things that we've promised our code does, we want to know that it does it. Um, and we want to encode those promises in a way that we can communicate with no ambiguity. And testing lets us do that, for sure. We also have to be able to make big, bold changes. We have to be able to go down those caves and put some central heating in or something. Perhaps not that. Um, but we have to be able to rip chunks of things. We have to be able to um, swap things out, be brave enough to um, adjust things and try things. And without that, we're going to go stale, and we're going to end up struggling a little bit on our kind of maintainability mission. So um, it's, it's vital, I think. And also, we get to understand the impact of certain changes. Like if you touch something over here, and suddenly something breaks over there, so you can kind of have your attention drawn to it. You know what's going on. So it's quite a few benefits of it. The downside, a lot of people think it takes longer. For me, I do quite aggressive TDD, and um, it doesn't, I think I'm quicker with tests. It helps me focus and uh, helps me get delivered, get, get things delivered. Um, but some people do think it's, it, it's, a, it's a cost, so it's something that it costs more to do. Tests can also be brittle. You know, it's possible to write test code that you end up hating because it gets in the way rather than help you. And this is where I think it comes more into an art form. Um, bad tests are probably worse than just not having any tests at all. So you can write bad tests, and it's, um, it's quite, quite common, too, as well. So um, we also 
don't want to introduce unnecessary complexity. Uh, just because we want to make something testable, um, you know, sometimes we can build in little abstractions that otherwise wouldn't be necessary. And that makes it more complicated than it needs to be just so we can test it. And that's not a very nice feeling. I think test code is more important than the program code. And this could be crazy, but imagine a world in the, in the distant future, 2019. That's not distant, but a few years. Um, maybe we just end up writing test code, and it's the machines doing the implementation. Maybe not, but we'll see. So I think the important thing to do is to treat our test code as though it's an extremely important part of our project. It isn't support code just so that we know our implementation's working. It's, it itself is a vital part of what we're doing and what we have. So we should look after it. Um, we, we, when we write test code, we are telling stories, really. We're storytellers. We're saying, this is going to happen in this way. This is what we expect. And you're, and you're kind of telling a story to your friends, to your colleagues in open source communities, uh, and to people in the future. We're telling stories. So it's vital that we tell a very clear story if we can. And you know, it's not just about, oh, this, this, I needed this test just to make sure this worked, and it's there now, and I'm, I'm never going to look at it again. Um, we, should, we should look at it. Um, and we should be, be aware of it, and, and we should care about it. So we also then want to have a look at our architecture of it, right? We want to make sure that our test code follows the same. It's just Go code, and we, we know how to write good Go code. So we just apply the kind of same principles and, and treat it as a, as a serious thing. You know, keep it simple. Have a, it should have a nice user experience. Somebody comes along, somebody new to the team, they want to be able to jump straight in and be productive. There's nothing worse than joining a project and you just don't feel like you can contribute. The best feeling is someone new to the team and they're knocking things out immediately. And you know, good tests can help you do that. And also listen to the code too. This works for production code, uh, program code, as well as test code. Sometimes things get difficult and uh, uh, messy well, it's, you need to address it. We can't just let the test code build up and up and up, uh, you know, hoping that it's, it's, it, it catches the things that we've said in the past. Um, we, should, we should care about it much more. So I'm going to quickly um, talk a little bit about some things that I think are, end up being quite bad tests, even though instinctively they probably seem good. One is when we just repeat something that we've said elsewhere. So if we have some constants, and we want to make sure those constants are constant. We then have tests to check that. And really, all we're doing is repeating ourselves. It's like having a CSS style sheet, say, this header is red. Then you have a test over here that says, is that header red? Well, yeah, it is, or not. But having it repeated is kind of unnecessary. And then when it comes to maintainability, this is just annoying. If we wanted to change pending to idle, um, it's kind of just busy work that we have to do. Um, so I think sometimes, you know, finding the right balance, finding the right things to test is important. Don't test things that you're not writing, that you're not contributing. So one example is um, if you have JSON unmarshalling as part of something that's going to happen, it's very tempting to list every field and make sure it did it properly. But we're not writing the JSON unmarshalling probably. So uh, we can just check one field, and we're done. Because otherwise, it's a very messy, uh, it's, it's, a not, it's not a very clear story. And, you know, we, we're not really trying to say, we need to make sure all these fields are right. We're, we're saying, uh, this will unmarshal JSON. And assuming that's working, then we can, we can move on. Um, it's a trade-off, because you might then, you might well miss fields, or there might be a JSON tag that's wrong or something. Um, but it's a trade-off, and it's a kind of balance, and it's a, there's a sweet spot somewhere. Yeah, if tests fail sometimes, what, what, why? I thought, what? Seriously, why, why do we ever have to type retest this, please? I don't, <laughs> I don't really don't get it. The other thing, uh, code coverage. You know, if this was real science, 100% code coverage is amazing. But it, it, all it means is you've really tightly coupled all that test code with the, 
the actual implementation, and it's very brittle. So if you want to change anything, you're going to end up doing a lot of work in your test code. So you can go too far with testing and with code coverage and things. So what makes some things lovely tests, then? Well, I think we should be testing the what, not the how. We want to, uh, we want to say, this is, a, this is a, uh, a method that's going to do something. We don't really want to encode how it's going to do it, because really, the, the, the goal would be somebody could replace that implementation, and it, we, we shouldn't have to change the test code. So keeping it, so it's not, it has to be coupled, of course, but not too tightly, I would say. Um, failed, if, if a test fails, it should point to what, what happened. That sounds obvious, but it's very easy to write tests that encapsulate quite a lot of um, different logic. And so you can end up with something quite fundamental changes, and every test fails. Now, you know something's wrong, but you don't really know what it is. Um, and if you, can, if you can find, get tests that, that when they fail, they're sort of laser focused on this failed, this one test failed, and here's why, then that's much more useful. So since this is Go code, and we're Go programmers, we can use our skills to help build things we need in order to improve testing, like helpers and test harnesses and things like that. Um, and there's lots of different things you can do, and some of these are real. This is quite a lot of code to see, but, but this is an example of something that actually turns out to be really quite useful. Essentially, I'm creating a test server, passing in the T so that we don't have to deal with errors. If something goes wrong, I can just fail that test. And I'm returning a, uh, a function which is going to do the cleanup for me. So this is very nice because um, everything that, that's going to happen with the life cycle of this test server is in one place. So we're creating it, we're configuring it with some sensible defaults, and we have a teardown as well, and we can do some cleanup. And because of the closure, we can even do additional assertions inside that, that cleanup. Um, and this is nice because we, we just defer it. We're just going to defer the call of it and, and know that that's going to tear it down. It's also quite nice if, if, we, if we change anything here, we can do it in here without touching all our tests. You know, they're just going to say tear down. If we created a few other things or kicked off some Go routines or something, we could tidy those up now uh, without, without having to affect any other code. Um, and you can build little kind of domain-specific helpers as well, like this, where you could say, OK, we're going to log in. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to create a, uh, a request as this user. This kind of stuff becomes very easy to read, and it's, it's, it's very literally telling a story of what's going on. Um, so these things are extremely useful. And if you're not aware of the HTTP test package, check it out, because for, for, for building HTTP servers and things, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's got everything you need. And maybe if you do build something that's actually quite useful and cool, Maybe it becomes part of the project. If it's a package, maybe you, it gets exported so that others can use it too if they, need to, if they need to test things, which they probably do. Yeah, so make things easy to read. Now, this is, um, this is my is package, just an example of it. This is like a mini testify. Um, you just wrap T, and then you, can make, you have some helpers like is no error, is true, uh, is equal. And the nice thing is, the, the thing that makes this a bit different is if that is true failed, is will go and get that comment and show you in the console that this failed, and they show up green like this. So that turns out to be a very nice way of um, of seeing what actually went wrong. Um, now with testify and with is, there are some people that don't like it, and Francesc is one of them. Um, this is because if you if you pass things by you know as interface and you pass things in to the equal, and it's going to check equality, you can actually be changing the, the, the representation of those uh, objects. So you don't, it, it, it's possible to get some strange behavior. Honestly, I, I've never had that problem. Um, it's possible, but I think it's edge case enough that it's actually the, the trade-off and the saving to get, to get this, be able to use this sort of language, I think is worth it. And uh, after a glass of wine or two, I did manage to get Francesc to thank me for the assert package. So that's, that's proof.
Thank you. So comment tests as well. Comment them, right? Tell, it's just Go code. Let's, let's just use this, the same patterns and the best practices and the, all that great stuff that we love in Go. Let's use that too. Yeah, so yeah, comment, comment them too. Um, mock dependencies, but don't, don't be silly. So you might have a mail sender interface. It makes perfect sense to mock that. You don't want to send an email every time you run your tests. Depends if you, yeah, that could be a good prank. But ideally not. But, that, but the, like the file system, it's probably, you can just use the file system. You know, when, wherever you run those tests, there's going to be a file system probably, otherwise you've, you've got bigger problems. Um, so there's no need to mock everything. So it's, again, sweet spot and the art, artistry of it. And I, I'm sorry for the self-promotion. This genuinely, this is extremely useful, I find, and hopefully you do too. It, it, you give it an interface and it generates these mock objects for you. So it's just a simple little code gen thing. Um, but the cool thing is it uses a technique that David Hernandez from Machine Box told me, uh, which is to, you, you can actually use function fields as the methods. And then these basically just get called uh, when, the, when the real method gets called. And what's nice about this is you can see this is the full test. And the behavior of the dependencies is in the same place as, as where you're writing the test. So from a storytelling point of view, that is extremely clear to see what's going on. And because of closures, you can even do additional assertions and things inside, inside the, the mocked functions. And like you return nil there, you could return an error if you wanted to test error cases and things. But don't test every error thing. This is another thing where we don't really want to shoot for 100% code coverage. If you've got some special error, then, of course, if it's part of the API design, then test it. If it's just we, this thing could return an error and we return it, let's just trust ourselves that we can do that, I think. We don't have to encode that in tests uh, and be too worried and, and, and overzealous. And also, uh, think about the, the right level of testing for your case. One example is you can, you can call handlers directly. The, the, they're just functions or methods. I like to do them as methods on a server object so that you can have your dependencies in there. Um, or you can actually test a bit more than that, and you can test the routing and things by calling the serve HTTP. So you've got a choice about the level that you're testing there. And you know there's a pure idea of uh, testing the smallest units and on all this, and, and it does make sense. But you can get a lot for free if you, if you step back a, a bit sometimes. So yes, fail fast and quick. If you're going to fail, you want to fail fast. There's nothing worse than waiting for uh, Travis to, to run all the tests before you can merge PRs and things. Um, and, and also, interface tests are really cool. Interface tests are essentially you, you, you have a, an interface, you pass it into this function, and it's testing the behavior of that at the interface level. So you can use this store test uh, function to test any implementation of a store. Now, if you're running an open source project, that's a great way to um, kind of uh, accept code, because you know it's passed this test, and therefore uh, it's OK, it's good to go in. It also means if you add to this and change any behaviors, you can, uh, you can do it in one place and, and test all of your implementations. So, Take some time, please, to learn the art of testing. Bye.